for electronic devices are switched to mute, and particularly if they're near any of the microphones, we're not getting any feedback as it comes through. Lots of feedback at the moment. What was that from? Oh, you pal. Oh, right, okay. And if uh, members are content, we will to proceed through the agenda as follows. Uh, first of all, apologies, there are no apologies. Uh, I remind members we are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests at each committee meeting as applicable. Any interests? Item 6. Item 6. Thank you, Jim. I am not sure, uh, Chair. It was just something about the pensions. I am not sure, Jim. I do not think it is ourselves. I think it is no. civil service. We do not come under okay, civil service. We just we'll double check it. No, because it is an independent pension provider. Yeah. Yeah. Privately yeah. Provided. Yep. Okay. Uh, we move on to the draft minutes of the proceedings of the 25th of March and the 8th of April 2020. I inform members of the draft minutes of the meeting on the 21st of March 2020 are at page 5, and the draft meetings of the minute of April 2020 are at page 11. Members, are you content that the draft minutes are accurate and records of proceedings? All those who hear say aye. aye. Any against? No. <coughs> and if we are agreed to be published on the website, are we agreed? Aye. Agreed. Uh, matters arising. Uh, we draw the members' attention to a response received from the Minister of the Committee to the Committee on relevant papers and issues raised during the evidence session on the Joint Order for Personal Protection Equipment PPE between the Department of Finance and Government of Republic of Ireland, tabled at page 3. I will ask members to comment, but um, having read the letter from the Minister of Finance, and I am particularly struck by the fourth paragraph from the end. Uh, when he says, when I was at the committee, you asked me to clarify comments made by the Deputy First Minister in relation to a contract for PPE. Having it looked at when the comment was made the afternoon of the 23rd of March, it was not in relation to the Chinese order. The Deputy First Minister was referring to a contract for PPE awarded on the 20th of March 2020 by CPDD on behalf of the Forensic Science Northern Ireland. Uh, I was present in the Assembly that day, and I do not think that was the recollection, recollection that I had. I will open up the further comments to the members. Sorry, Paul. Uh, Chair, do you want to deal with the whole aspect of this now? Yeah, let us deal with the whole aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, that, that paragraph from uh, my mind, too, um, strange. I, to me, this is the wrong date. The date I was alluding to uh, was the Deputy First Minister's public utterances on the 28th, when she put out her tweet, uh, a day after Conor Murphy, the Finance Minister, spoke to press about a very significant order for PPE had been made, and he was alluding to the Dublin Partnership. So there, there's no question in my mind that the Deputy First Minister was alluding to that Dublin Partnership when she tweeted the very next day, especially when the press were all over it the day before. Um, so. You know, there is this, still this gap uh, in understanding between what Connor, the Finance Minister, was saying uh, on the 27th and what the Deputy First Minister was saying the day after, and then what, Con what the Finance Minister told us at the committee. Uh, and, and that's something that I we still need to iron out. Let, let, let me stress that we need PPE from everywhere and anywhere, um, and I certainly support any efforts uh, in that regard. What, what are, we had obviously asked for all the, the written submissions. Uh, what strikes me about the written submissions and the email trail, uh, there's a number of things. Uh, he made the statement on the 27th and tells us then that during that weekend, 27th was a Friday, during the weekend, all started to unravel with regards to the Chinese orders. But the Finance Minister was, was, fin finance minister was still talking about the order on the, on the 31st, which was the week after that weekend. Uh, and he was t telling the Chamber, he was telling the Assembly through questions and statements that the order was still significant. It was still, uh, and that troubles me. Uh, and then, we have all these email trails, and you can see you can see the work that's been going in. You can see the effort, and you can see the exchanges both within the departmental structure here in the assembly and the executive, and also the engagement between here and the Republic of Ireland. But in no time 
Do we see any clear commitment from the Republic's government or officials to actually say, yes, we agree, we should do this jointly? There is a commitment to communicate, there is a commitment to see a list of stock that we need, but there is no, there is no real cast iron guarantee that there is anything that could be coming into a contractual sense. Now, maybe that's in another email exchange. If it is, let us see it. What worries me more than anything, though, is that if the 27th was the Friday and it all started to unravel at the weekend, why, why are there no email exchanges in the 1st and 2nd of April? Why, why does it go cold, quiet? Because there's been a series of frantic emails exchanges between all the departments and between and, and liaising with the Republic of Ireland officials. That weekend's where it all goes wrong. And then on the Monday and the Tuesday, there are no emails. No emails whatsoever. Now I find that really strange. And I just don't understand why there would have been no communication with email on those two dates. Because if somebody was coming in on the Monday and heard, my goodness, this doesn't sound good, this has all gone unravel, surely the first thing you do is make contact. And because the medium that they've been using up until now has been emails, where are they on the Monday and the Tuesday? Where are the emails? Now, there is, they talk about phone calls and they talk about numbers and, and everything, that's fine. But surely you want this in writing. If something is unravelling, you want it in writing to be clear so you can tell your departments exactly what's going on because the departments had already sent their stock through. Mm. This troubles me, still troubles me. And we, I, I would like to know where are the email exchanges for the 1st and 2nd of April? Okay. Um, and again, through the chair, I have a, again, sort of <coughs> comments I have. I, I'm, I'm just following the trail through because I'm trying to get it right in my own mind. There's a comment about the OGP, which is, I believe, is the Irish State's Procurement Agency. And they were saying on the 7th of April that they advised that they no longer needed to procure PPE. So who was the contract with? Was it just the Northern Ireland <coughs> Executive or the Department of Finance through its procurement division? Was the only people attempting, attempting to procure through this order? If OGP said they were no longer attempting to procure PPE, I think there's a there's a there's a degree of clarity. I think that I would like to see. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, can I just check a couple of things first and foremost? Are we talking here about the minutes uh, of that meeting, or are we talking here about uh, the correspondence that you've received since? This correspondence that's within the table. Correspondence. Papers. Well, Chair, you know, uh, I often wonder too just the role of the chair in, in, in this situation and whether or not that's just feeding into maybe some of these what appear to be nearly like uh, allegations in a sense. I think that at our last meeting we had ample opportunity, ample opportunity of interrogating, and I'm sure that was the correct word for it as well, to the interrogation of uh, the minister. And uh, I was really impressed by the way that he had actually uh, dealt with each and every issue as it was presented to him. Uh, and included in that, in a very, very short notice, he was asked to produce written evidence as well, too, of the communications that, that had been taking place, which uh, has been provided to us as a committee. Now, all of this was at a time uh, when one can uh, appreciate uh, just uh, how busy uh, and how much of a distraction this could have been to, to a minister, who, in fact, if anything, um, was doing his best in every respect uh, to meet the needs of those who were delivering service to the needy here in the north of Ireland. And I think that the Minister is to be commended in every way for the work that he has carried out at that point in time and since then as well too. To me, this is nothing more than a witch hunt. And I think it's about time that we call a halt to it. We have had ample opportunity to interrogate the Minister. He produced the evidence at short notice that was requested of him by the committee as such. Uh, but now I think it is time we actually call a halt to this and that we should move on and deal with more pressing matters, uh, more pressing matters such as uh, the budget and the likes of this coming forward at this uh, present point in time. Um, and to start 
uh, heroin, which has already been ploughed, to use an expression that we use quite often in the country, and I'm sure you're all familiar enough with it, I think is both a waste of time of this committee and is only but reflective only but reflective of the attitude of some members of this committee towards the finance minister. Okay. Thank you. Jim? Uh, Chair, could I take you back to your reference to the fourth last paragraph of the minister's letter of the 20th of April, where, as you read out, he introduces a totally new narrative about what the deputy first minister was referring to. Uh, and now suggests that, in fact, um, though everything she said was in the context of coronavirus, she's actually referring to a contract with the Forensic Science Division. The difficulty with that narrative is this, that when you go to the EU electronic diary, the daily diary, and look up that particular contract, you discover that was a contract that went out to tender in October 2019, long before anyone had ever heard of coronavirus, with the tendering process closing in November and then ultimately a contract awarded in March. And also when you peruse the documents, you discover that it was a contract for three years with two periods of possible extension each of two years. So it was a possible contract for seven years with a supply of materials which were not coronavirus originated. They were for, yes, personal protection equipment, of course, forensics and let's use that, and for outdoor clothing and other personal protection consumables. So to have the minister tell us that whereas on the 8th of April he didn't know what Ms. Sonia was talking about, that he now believes she was talking about a forensic science contract really does not fit within the scenario that what Ms. O'Neill was talking about on the 23rd of March was all contextualised to the coronavirus challenge. I think it stretches credulity to believe that, in fact, she was referring to a non-coronavirus contract which had gone out for contract almost six months before, before anyone had ever heard of coronavirus. So I think this is a substantial red herring. The uh, forensic science contract, it patently is not coronavirus related, and yet we're now being asked to believe that when the Minister said a contract was signed today, the 23rd of March, <coughs> even though she was talking at that time about coronavirus, that it wasn't a coronavirus contract at all. It was a forensic science contract which had come into, um, which had been originated months before. Bizarre. Any other commentary? A point of information, Chair, I may have been wrong. I apologise for my dates. Uh, just so for accuracy, it was Monday the 30th and Tuesday the 31st that there are no emails. And then they crank back up again on the 1st, Wednesday. So it's the 30th and the 31st where there are no emails presented here by the department. And I find that strange that that was the Monday and Tuesday after the weekend it all unravelled. Why is there no exchanges? Why is there no communication uh, between departments and then also between the Finance Department and the Republic of Ireland officials? I think looking at this and having heard what everybody says from the group, unless I... Sorry, go ahead, Matthew. Um, sorry, Chair. I mean, I... I, um, I guess, to put on record two points, it, there can be a case of, in a sense, both sides having a point here. I think it's fairly clear that, the, as we discussed last, last week or the week before last, the finance minister, um, for whatever reasons, gave a, an impression that people in the public and the media interpreted in one way. He, 
Um, he didn't seem terribly pleased by being um, challenged on that, what was a fair, an interpretation that got abroad. I would say to colleagues in other parties that it wasn't, it's not just a, you know, there, there are legitimate questions to ask about, about, um, about the way that was communicated, and I think that was done in the committee, and those were legitimate questions to ask. Um, what I would say, and I, and I preface it by saying I haven't gone through all the emails in great detail, as colleagues on the, on the committee seem to have done, what I would say is that it would be helpful now if, there, if the committee wants to proceed to spend more time and resource on investigating this issue, um, understanding that it is, as um, Melissa McHugh just said, a time of extreme pressure for all departments, and when our own time is limited, that we would have a specific request for the, you know, what it is we're actually asking the Department of Finance to provide us. So I'm not opposed to us pursuing this issue in some form at some point, but I think we have to be very cognizant of the fact that the, that, you know, the priority at the minute is dealing with the crisis in front of mm -hmm. us, that being said. Um, so it, it would be helpful to have a, a, a clear steer on what it is people are actually concerned about, mm -hmm. because you know, in one sense, I think we put on the record the, the, the concern about the way it was communicated by, by the Minister, and I do share some of those concerns. Indeed, I was the one who asked him about it on the floor of the Assembly, but I suppose my question now would be, to what extent is it uh, useful for us at the minute to continue pursuing it when, we can re when it could be returned to at a different point if an individual members are obviously entitled to ask questions and pursue it in their own form? So that would be my um, comment slash question. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, from the Chair's perspective, I have heard from members of the committee, and yes, we are in a position of COVID virus, and yes, we are. We have quite urgent matters to go through. And I had expected by the Minister's correspondence to come back today that actually many of the questions would have been answered. My only issue, well, I have two issues. Uh, I listened to what the members have said, and I have listened to what uh, uh, Jim Allister has said, and listened to what Paul Frew has said. But that also ties in with, particularly on between that fourth paragraph, where the implication was that the uh, Deputy First Minister was talking about a contract for PPE that was due from China. And if we look through the documentation, we see that through the OPG, the actual contract itself hadn't never been signed, and there was no contract because OPG decided they weren't going ahead with the, the deal for PPE. My concern is, is that it's been, the implication is that by the minister's letter and his comments, he was implying that the deputy first minister was talking about a contract that had not already been let much previously back in October. And for that, I would probably like to have some clarity. I'm quite happy for that for written clarity to come to the committee for that particular issue, particularly the issue when that contract had first been raised, and particularly <coughs> with the European procurement agency process. There is definite detail, and that is readily available. And if a member can bring that up fairly quickly, I should suspect the department should as well. I also, as we will aware from the budgeting process, there is £150 million that has been allocated towards PPE, and we have no indication of how that is likely to be spent, where it is going to be spent, and the process of procurement that is going to. Let us be abundantly clear that we need PPE from any source that we can. We need it for our vital health services, for our health care workers, and everybody. It is up for us as a committee to make sure that we have an overview and clarity of what that is doing. So, bearing in mind that the information is readily available through the Europe on sort of the web system, I would ask that we would uh, ask the uh, we would ask the Department of Finance for further clarity on that. And if we move on that, are we content for that? Can I add just add to that because we have a job to do here, and that's to scrutinise. Um, and there will be things that come up in our agendas that some of us will class as not being uh, particularly uh, uh, important at any significant any given time, but we still have to do our job. If I can direct members to page 10 of the table papers, uh, Sean Smith uh, talks to your Paul Quinn uh, from the Irish Government. Good morning, Paul. I'm not going to ask how you are, as I'm sure you're under pressure. Des said he was speaking to you in relation to PPE gloves, aprons, masks, etc. Who would be the, per the best person in OGP to contact about this? That's the first, that's the first contact that we have in our emails. So I think we do need to ask the question about the missing days. Why was there no exchanges, especially when it was such a critical time? But also, I think we need to ask Des. Now, I take it that's Des Armstrong. No. No? No. 
It's a Dublin official, I think. Dublin official. I read that as a, an official from OGP. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so we need to find out where the where this all started, and the actual context of what was expected. Uh, and we we haven't have, we don't have that with this email exchange. This this email exchange shows a lot of good work and communication between departments and between the two jurisdictions. But there's no real officialdom. There's no real clarity as to what was expected. <laughs> Well, I've made a proposal that we seek clarity, particularly around the issues of when the contract for the forensic sciences uh, had first been raised. Right, through the chair, uh, and again, too, uh, I, I just come back to exactly the same point again. I think it was fairly obvious at the time of our last meeting, whenever we did have the minister present, that there were people in this committee who clearly had misinterpreted what the minister had said, and he was very, very. Uh, direct about that, when in fact he had actually challenged some of the comments that you had made yourself. Uh, and I, I, I go a stage further and say once again just that this, in fact, is anything but harrowing over ground that has already been ploughed. And, uh, and I know you, you intend to make a proposal. I don't intend to support it. Uh, and I would have a counter proposal uh, to make it at the same time that we move on and that we deal with the other matters in hand that are of the utmost importance for this committee, rather than again to uh, continue in this witch hunt. Uh, I've, I'm, making a, I'm making a proposal that we seek further clarity around the issues of the uh, forensic science uh, contract uh, that had been signed and had been referred to by, apparently by the Deputy First Minister in the timing of that. I would further add, just for the sake of completeness, I would add further details on the email exchange from which dates, Deputy? The, the, oh, the first, uh, sorry, the, uh, the 30th, right. Monday the 30th of March and Monday, Tuesday the 31st of March. That was the, the first two days after the whole thing unravelled that weekend. Uh, there's no, no email exchanges for those two days. Okay. Could I have a seconder? Jim Wells. I have charges to get the, the wording of this right. Sir, sir, just I know that you're, you you are moving uh, towards towards your vote, but there was a proposal there from or, or not there was a, a a form of words from Matthew there where we can set this you know set this aside, move on with the important business that we have today. Those and and. I personally would have loved the time spent here in finding where our spend is of the £150 million, pounds, mm -hmm. how that's coming in and how that's getting out to nursing homes. I mean, with the shock figures that we have today of the fatalities within our nursing sector here right across Northern Ireland. So I'm not sure that we really need a vote on this. I mean, there's a proposal there with the chair. But I, one, if I could, one, one suggestion I would make is that, because I, I do think it's legitimate to, to continue to, scru to scrutinise and ask questions, but as Pat says, we don't want a huge amount of, of bluntly at the minute, a huge amount of committee time spent, and this is my view, but I would suggest that if, we, if the proposal is to ask for more um, written information, it would be helpful to see a version of the letter before it's going to be sent. So it might be something that a letter could come back to the committee perhaps next week so that we could have a, um, a view on what the on what the content is being asked for because I feel if we're being asked to give a view on, on just any communication at all it could be it could be quite broad. Personally I'm not opposed to asking for more written clarity. I think that's you know at the minute the departments aren't having to field assembly questions in general very much many fewer. So I think it's it's not a legitimate thing to ask additional questions, but it would be helpful to see how we're framing that as a committee. Yeah, do you want to put a counter-proposal on the table, Matt? So my, my proposal would be to, um, to that we, um, uh, in a sense, um, delay dividing on the question of whether to send a letter until we have a draft letter, which um, I, I presume would be at next week's meeting. Second. So, right, just to the Chair, I'm amazed, you know, uh, that uh, that you choose to ask Matthew if he wished to make a kind of proposal. You didn't ask me uh, if I wished to make you a kind of proposal. Had. Whenever I suggested it myself, whenever I suggested it myself, you didn't ask me. Uh, and if anything, it just questions then uh, um, how independent the chair is when dealing with a, a situation like this. Sorry, chair, I must object to that. Mr. McHugh's proposal is a direct negative of yours. 
Therefore, it doesn't need a separate proposal. Yes. It's a direct negative. Uh, End of. We, I, I listen to, I listen to all sides. I intend to be as fair and as appropriate as possible. In the process of trying to reach a consensus, we have listened to what uh, Matthew said. Matthew O'Toole said, "I want to put Matthew O'Toole's proposal to the committee." and look to draft a letter, circulate it amongst the committee, and then we bring it back to the committee next week for decision. Hmm. All those in favour say aye. 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 But, Chair, just one other point I'd like to make as well. Too. I'd like to remind you and your Vice Chair that at one of our very first meetings, you actually talked about consensus within this committee and to ensure we would move forward on that basis. Uh, quite clearly, uh, that seems to have been forgotten by both the Chair and the Vice Chair in this respect. Again, too, and I go back to the point that I made earlier that we continue in the witch hunt. Okay. Can I come into that? Uh, Sorry, just hold on a second, one chair. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do today. I've heard what you said, I've noted what you said. I think I've made it very clear to this committee that I will give latitude and fairness to all points of view as we go through this committee. There are significant questions that need to be asked from this letter which I think are germane to all the Assembly, not just to political parties. There are real issues that here, which we have seen from other political parties around this table, who wish to see issues of this raised. So therefore, there is a proposal on the table, which I support from uh, Matthew O'Toole, that we produce a letter which we circulate, and then we decide from that, we bring it to the front of the committee next week to decide whether we are going to take this further. But I believe quite strongly from what I've seen from the evidence that's been produced, that there are other questions that need to be asked, and it is our job as a committee to provide scrutiny. And your points are noted. Okay. okay. Sorry, Chair, can I formally suggest then that the, the proposal from, from Matthew Tull is to uh, delay any decision in relation to the Minister's response until the committee can see a draft letter? Of what has been proposed at next week's meeting. All those in favour? Uh, to see and agree. To see and agree. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good time. Okay. Right. Gentlemen. Sorry, uh, Chair. Who is in favour? Yeah. And against. Against. Carried. Right, if we move on to the written evidence, the Department of Finance, Finance Division, Budget 2021. I'm going to draw your attention, please, to the clerk's brief at page 16. Sorry, bring my system. A response from the Department of the Department of Finance to the Budget, page 2021, at page 17, and the response to the Committee's questions relating to the 2021 Budget process at page 32. We are bringing you on to the table papers at page 50. Uh, there is a suggested line of questions in relation to the Budget 2021-22 and funding <coughs> response to COVID-19. At page 52 is an update from the Department in advance of the meeting on the 29th of April on the Budget 2021, again COVID-19. And table at page 59, a response from the Department of Finance to a Committee for Finance request for information regarding the allocation of resources for COVID-19. Uh, table at page 68 is the briefing paper from the Assembly's Research and Information Service, which aims to support coordinated Assembly scrutiny of Executive Budget 2021. I advise members that any questions members have in relation to the Department of Finance Department of Budget will be recorded by the clerk and sent to the Department for written response within 24 hours of receipt. Once a response is received from the Department, this will be issued to members by email and will be included in papers for the next committee meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, questions? I think the, the clerk's questions at page 50 of the table papers are pretty much on the money. Thank 
excuse me, I want to have a quick IT mare. Any further comments, team? If we're content, then can we invite the questions that be raised in the clerk's paper to be sent to the department for a response? Agreed. All those agreed? Uh, I'd also like to seek agreement to forward the research paper to the Department for a response to the questions we relate to its remit, either in writing or at next week's oral evidence session from the Public Cent Spending Directorate. Are we content? I remind members on the 20th and 21st of April, committee members were asked by email to agree to forward the response from the Department of Finance to a Committee of Finance request for information regarding the allocation of resources for COVID-19 and the additional update of the budget 2021 COVID-19 to all statutory committees. Uh, the following members agreed to circulate the response on the 20th of April to the committees. Steve, Paul, Pat, Jim, two Jims and Melissa. And the following agreed on the 21st of April to, uh, to circulate to all committees the update papers on the budget 2020-21. Steve, Pat, Gemma, Matthew and Paul. Uh, could I have formal agreement for the purpose of recording in the minutes to forward the response from the Department of Finance regarding the allocation of resources for COVID-19 and the update budget 2021 to all statutory committees. Agreed. Are we agreed? agreed? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, if we move on to the written evidence of the Department of Finance Public Service Reform Division Voluntary Exit Scheme, I'd like to draw the members' attention to the Department's written briefing paper in response to the Voluntary Exit Scheme raised by the Committee and further contextual information at page 37. I'd like to remind the members that quite a number of issues have been raised in, raised in relation to the voluntary exit scheme, including indications of increases in sickness and levels at the time of the implementation of the scheme. I'd like to invite any questions from the members. Any comments? Table 1 at page 51. Um, I think it's quite a striking table. It shows the staff levels in 2015 as compared to the staff levels in 2020. And at the bottom of those tables, there is an addition of the permanent plus temporary plus vacancy, giving that in 2015, there were 25,714 full-time equivalents. In 2020, when you add those two together, it was 22,973. But what is most striking about the table in Table 1 is the fact that in 2015 there were no agency staff, but in 2020 there are 2,500. And if and when you add the 2,500 in, there's your total permanent temporary vacancy plus agency, you arrive at a virtual equivalent figure between the staff levels in 15 and the staff levels in 20. Begging the question, what did VES achieve? If you have 25,500 people before you start and you have 25,500 people after you finish, apart from spending whatever tens of millions it was, what did it achieve? I would add to that too. Oh. To me, this is very worrying, but I would also add to if you pour this down into an individual story. Those agency workers will not mm. be in anywhere near protected a contract or right. sufficient uh, contract as was the uh, the full time equivalent uh, in mm. 2015. So it, it begs the question: Where's the future in this? Where's it going? Will those agency staff be recruited full time, uh, permanent contracts, or, or do they just carry on working with no secure tenure of employment at all? Uh, so it begs all those moral questions about staff. Mm -hmm. um, the other question I have for the committee, and it was raised when I looked at this, I mean, the whole purpose of the voluntary exit scheme in the first place was to improve efficiencies and make savings. And regardless of whether you agree with the process or not, I haven't seen any evidence of any savings, and I haven't ev seen any evidence of any efficiencies. And I'm, a, to be honest with you and the rest of the committee, 
I'm at a loss to see what's actually been achieved. Now, if, I would be delighted if somebody here could tell me that we have achieved something by the voluntary exit scheme, but I think not for this time, and bearing in mind the importance of COVID, I think this might be something that, uh, when we come to the other side of the, the crisis, it might be something that we look at fairly closely. And may I take the comments from the Vice Chair about how about when we're talking about agency staff, you know, continuity of employment, and many of these people mm -hmm. who will be, uh, I would imagine, being sort of re-employed again after 18 months or two years. Again, this is a significant issue that we need to be cognisant of. Sir, Jim. Um, could it be that um, the staff that went under voluntary exit were highly paid, experienced staff, and the staff that are in contract are on much lower down the scale? And obviously, being in contract, they can be uh, removed or added to at will. So ha there may have been a saving in the overall budget, salary budget, as opposed to the overall numbers. And it's just I'd be interested to see what the actual it's cost of the twenty-five thousand is rather than the actual numbers. Well, well, could we chair ask for the salary, the pay bill total of 2015, and in 2015 terms, the pay bill total in 2020? And uh, counting the voluntary agency staff now? Yeah. Good point. In addition to that, with pay scales, it may be that some of those people are lower down the scale, so it might also be useful for the committee to get information in relation to grade. Yes. Yes. And of course the other thing that won't have been factored into it would be recruitment costs and also agency costs that costs will actually go to the agencies to provide those staffing. Yeah. So those figures that also have to be brought into the overall picture. Matthew? Yeah, well, sorry Chair. I mean I was going to additionally ask this is a level of detail that may be quite hard to give, but is there any um, clarity on age profile of, uh, we talked a little bit about this whenever the unions are in front of us, age profile of oh, successful applicants, because I think it's something that worth look at is a, an issue that the United Civil Service faces in terms of me being ageist, but it does have a significantly um, higher than average age profile, and there's a recruitment issue in terms of getting people in. Um, and, and keeping them there, so it would just be helpful to know, understand if it had a, if an effect on the age profile of the Northern Ireland Civil Service as a whole, if that uh, data exists. Okay. So, of agency staff? Uh, well, of agency staff, but also just in general, like is there, a, is there data on um, the average age of successful um, v, uh, voluntary redundancy applicants, and did it have a an impact on the, if it didn't have an impact very much on headcount, overall headcount, did it have an, impa an impact on the age profile of the Northern Ireland Civil Service? Mm. So there was the age profile information in correspondence which the committee yeah, there is Would it be useful if we draw the attention to the members about that age profile in correspondence right, sorry, at the moment? Could be that, if you just, uh, Jim, if you could just pull out the picture of it. I think the startling thing of the age profile of the uh, correspondence is trying to find anybody in the Northern Ireland Civil Service who is below the age of 30 is proving increasingly difficult. And it is being, the wedge is moving out to, sort of, seems to be moving out to 50 plus. If we could just this is page 167. Page 167, if you'd just like to have a look at that, Matthew. Okay. Yeah. That's of the current civil service. Yes, yeah. and that's broken down by department. And but Matthew, I think, was asking about the age profile of those who who took the voluntary exit. Well, this will provide a, a comparator then as well. So, is it, sorry, successful applicants for the yeah, yeah. voluntary exit scheme. Yeah, and if it just if it had a, if it if they if they have any data on whether it changed the overall age profile of the civil service. Um, I think the proposal is, when we get to the other side of COVID, I think this is something we need to look very closely at as a committee. And I would like your agreement as if we have this within the sort of the future work programme. But I think, just from what we've seen so far, there are some significant questions that need to be answered. 
Are we content? Agreed. Agreed. <coughs> if we move on to the next item on the agenda, primary legislation functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill. I want to draw the members' attention to the clerk's brief on the extension of the committee stage at page 81. Inform members that the committee stage of the bill is due to end on 13 May 2020. Understanding Order 334, the committee may bring forward a motion to the Assembly to extend the committee stage until a date specified. I remind the meeting at the, uh, members at the meeting on the 25th of March, the committee agreed to seek to extend the committee stage until Wednesday, the 2nd of December 2020. I need to seek agreement that the following wording for the motion to extend be agreed. I need to put to the committee the following draft motion and seek agreement or amendment that, in accordance with Standing Order 33.4, the period referred to in Standing Order 33.2 be extended to the 2nd of December 2020 in relation to the committee stage of the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill NIA Bill 01 forward slash 17-22. I would like to inform the members that the agreed motion will be laid in the business office and the timing of the subsequent plenary debate and the motion will be scheduled uh, once considered to, by the business committee. I will put that to the committee. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? Aye. Passed. Uh, I would like to draw members' attention to a number of papers relating to this agenda item. A response from the Right Honourable Sir Patrick Coughlin and colleagues from the RHI inquiry declining to comment on the bill on page 82. Response from David Sterling, head of the civil service at page 83, confirming his attendance at the meeting on the 6th of April. And response from the finance minister and the permanent secretary for the Department of Finance at page 84, uh, confirming their attendance on the 13th of May. Sorry, sir, just to clarify, that should be the 6th of May in relation to the civil service. 6th of May, okay. Ask I think members, he's no. physically going to be here. Yeah, he's actually. I, I think so. Yes, it hasn't been completely confirmed yet, but I think that's the intention in relation to both parties. Matthew, sorry, just clarify that. Who's going to be here instead of? Head of the civil service. Head of civil service is going to be one of us. Okay, yeah, it's Sterling. Okay. First week. Um, yeah. uh, with my, 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 just in relation, if, if I may, chair, on the letter we've received back from Patrick Coughlin. Um, is that worthy of discussion within the committee, and do we think that's are we happy to um, to have to have it passed that the Patrick Hawkins effectively saying no, computer says no, I'm not you know, in the nicest possible way. He's telling us he's not going to. I mean, I, clearly he did a very long inquiry and he answered. You know, he he presented his findings to the media, but I suppose it's my question is whether that we are content that we're not allowed to question him any further or question the. I don't know if others have a comment. Well, Chair, just uh, Sir Patrick Cochran made recommendations in the RHI report. So, if he says that, basically he's saying that's the recommendations. Go with that. Read the report. Read the report. Uh, what are you going to do? Force him to come in? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, you're right. But I suppose my, if I may, Chair, I suppose um, my the. One point I would make is that we, because of what the way the day the RHI report happened, we were it was basically one of the last days of normality before COVID happened. Um, uh, you know, and, and we then had a weekend. And you know, to be fair, the minister came and like gave a you know debated it with relatively little notice. But you know, there are big things. I, I'm not sure that the public is completely content yet that the Assembly has done a huge amount of scrutiny on the RHI report. Um, so my question would be just whether I wonder if, if there's uh, if, if we were at a committee are completely happy that um, we're kind of effectively being told go away and read the report some more. Uh, Jim? Yeah, well, I wasn't at all surprised by Sir Patrick's response. I sort of anticipated that he would probably say I have done the report, I've done my bit. What you now do with it is up to you. Um, on Matthew's point, we were inviting him on the narrow ground. Right. Do you want to comment on this draft bill? Mm -hmm. I think you're talking about a wider invitation. Can we quiz you about your report? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not sure. Well, certainly that isn't what we asked him. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that's territory we can really go into. I mean, for the committee, I'm sort of reminded to take Gemma's view because. Um, I think all he can do is say, 
read the recommendations in my report, and yeah. it's because it's specifically responding to yeah. scrutiny of your bill. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what added benefit there would be from that, but I, I note, I, I note, I note your, I note your comments, Matthew. Okay. Are are we content with that, too? Yeah. Could I take one point of clarification from the clerk? Um, a date was set. It's one of these days for public response in the consultation. I think it's the 24th, yeah, yeah. so that would be Friday. Right. Uh, is that an absolute cut-off, or if someone writes in after that, is it... That's an entirely matter for the committee, but anything okay. that comes in, I, I will put before the committee. Yeah. Okay. So Nick, by next week, we will be seeing... It's not a very auspicious time to yeah, get anyone to write in, but... It, uh, it would be my intention to have all responses with the on time for the committee meeting on the 6th of May. So that would, PACs going out for that meeting would issue on the 1st of May. Okay. Would, would, right. Have you any idea of what's flowing in? There hasn't been a lot to date. Is that a euphemism for none? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, double figures? And, uh, <laughs> there's... Most people leave it until the last, the last minute. You should be a politician. <laughs> is, it, is it more than no, ten? I, I don't think so, no. Uh, stop. So Jim, Jim, stop badgering the clerk. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> okay, team, let's, let's, I think we've got the answer. So let's move on. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the subordinate legislation, statutory 2020-29, Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order in Northern Ireland 2020. I draw a member's attention to the following papers relating, relating to the agenda item. Clark's briefing note at page 86. Uh, Statutory 2029, Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2020 at page 87. Response to the committee and the department explaining the short time period between an SL1 and SR, leaving no opportunity for scrutiny at the committee at page 95. The SL1 considered by the committee on 18th of March 2020 at page 97. And the examiner of statutory rules fifth report at page 50. I'll inform the members that the rule will be subject to negative resolution. Remind the members at the meeting of the 18th of March 2020, the committee considered the initial proposal for subordinate legislation and members were content with the proposal. The department has confirmed that there are no changes to the overall policy since the initial proposals were submitted to the committee. I would like to inform the members that in the, ex in the examiner of statutory rules fifth report of session 2019-20, published on the 21st, 25th of March 2020, the examiner has confirmed that she is raising no points about the rule by way of technical scrutiny. Members, if we are content, are we content? Yeah. I will put, to the, put you to the question. The Committee for Finance has considered statutory rule 2020-29, the public services Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and this has no objection to the rule. All those in favour say aye. 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 And we move on to item 8 in the agenda, subordinate legislation, statutory rule 2020-43, <coughs> the whole of government accounts, designation of bodies, order, Northern Ireland 2020. I'd like to draw members' attention to the following papers relating to the agenda item, Clark's briefing noted, page 108. Statutory Rule 2020-43, the whole of government accounts, designation of bodies, order, Northern Ireland 2020 at page 109. SL1 considered by the committee on the 18th of March 2020 at page 118. I'd like to inform the members that the rule will be subject to negative resolution. I'd like to remind members at the meeting of the 18th of March 2020, the committee considered the initial proposal for subordinate legislation and members were content with the proposal. The Department has confirmed that there are no changes to the overall policy since the initial proposals were submitted to the Committee. I would like to inform the members in the Examiner of Statutory Rules Fifth Report of Session 2019-20 is published on the 25th of March 2020. The Examiner has confirmed that she is raising no points about the rule by way of technical scrutiny. Members, are we content? Therefore, I would like to put to the members the Committee for Finance has considered Statutory Rule 2020-43. The whole of government accounts, designation of bodies, order, Northern Ireland, and has no objection to the rule. All those in favour say aye. 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 Any against? Thank you. We move on to uh, uh, 
agenda item number nine, subordinate legislation, standing rule 2020-59, the rate, regional rate order of Northern Ireland 2020. Draw members' attention to the following papers relating to this agenda item. Clark's briefing note at page 129. Statutory rule 2020-59, the rate, regional rate order of Northern Ireland 2020 at page 130. SL1 considered by the Committee on 5 February 2020 at page 135. Examiner of Statutory Rules 7th Report at page 138. I'd like to inform the members the rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure of the Assembly. It does not come into operation unless affirmed by the Assembly. I'd like to remember, my members at the meeting of 5 February 2020, the Committee considered the initial proposal for subordinate legislation and members were content with the proposal. The Department has confirmed that there were no changes to the overall policy since the initial proposals were submitted to the Committee. I would like to inform members that the Examiner of Statutory Rules 7th Report of Session 2019-20, published on 17 April 2020, the Examiner has confirmed that she is raising no points about the rule by way of technical scrutiny. Are we still content, members? Therefore, I put it to you that the Committee for Finance has considered statutory rule, the rates, regional order, Northern Ireland, and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? Aye. I move on to item number 10 of the uh, agenda, subordinate legislation, statutory rule 2020-47, the pensions increase review order 2020. I'd like to draw members' attention to statutory rule 2020-47, the Pensions Increase Review Order 2020 at page 147, and the SL1 considered by the Committee on the 21st of March 2020 at page 153. I would like to inform members that this must be laid in the Assembly, but is not subject to further Assembly procedure. Remind members that at the meeting of the 25th of March, the Committee considered the initial proposal for subordinate legislation, and members were content with the proposal. Still content? The Department has confirmed that there are no changes to the overall policy since the initial proposals were submitted to the Committee. The Examiner of Statutory Rules confirms while she would consider this rule by way of technical scrutiny, she will not include it in her report unless, there are any, un, unless to raise any points in relation to rule. Members, are we content to note? Yeah. Noted. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, move on to item number 11 of the agenda. Chair, apologies. I've, I'm, I'm doing this out of order, but just a, a question I'd love to have an answer to is in relation to the whole government accounts and the, um, the but we're now in, we've, we've just affirmed the, the, the order, so I'm slightly delayed by a few minutes in asking. But just I note a couple of the bodies that are, I presume these are copied and pasted over from previous years, but um, are the bodies essentially to be consolidated in the whole of government accounts? It includes... Um, ILEX, which is the der the mm -hmm. regeneration company in Derry. Um, I think its name was it? Yeah, it was the urban regeneration company in Derry that was wound up, and I don't know if it's if it's formally wound up yet, or maybe it's not wound up and it still exists in Company's House in some form or other. But it, it, just that I, it stuck out as me as I was glancing through it, um, and uh, so I, I just uh, it would be. Interesting. Quite like, why are they, do they still need to consolidate the accounts if it's no, if it no longer into the whole the whole government accounts which go to the treasury? What's the, just a question? Well, it's a good um, <laughs> slightly pointless question because we've already affirmed. No, but, 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 but thank you for that. Yeah, Ilex was wound up, wound up, wasn't it? I think so. It, it, it's certainly no, well. It's certainly no longer operational, um, and I don't know if it. It may be an accounting. There may be an accounting reason that it has to be consolidated. It may exist in some legal. It may have some legal character that still exists. Clarification on the status of Ireland. Certainly, sure, sure. why, why it's why that is um, consolidated in the whole of government accounts. Whole spot. And the prize for spotting goes to <laughs> after the fact. member from South Belfast. <laughs> after we've already. Um, I, mean, I don't think I'm sure there's an explanation for it, but it'd just be helpful to know what it is. No, but it's 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 important that if it, that is an anomaly that's investigated. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, 
As before we were uh, started the formal proceedings today, I informed you of uh, the death of the mother of Phil Bateman, the Arsiswin uh, Assembly of the Clerk, the committee. Um, as I said, I have already talked to Phil today, and I am sure he would appreciate any calls from any members of the, uh, of the committee who would wish to make the calls as well. But I would like your approval to write to Phil to express the committee's condolence on his loss, and I would like to do that forthwith, please, if you have approval. All yeah. those agreed? Okay. And uh, we have moved on to correspondence, and there's unfortunately there's quite a lot of it, so we'll go through it. Ask members to consider the following correspondence: uh, response to the committee from the department detailing the dilapidation payments process from start to finish, at page 161. Any questions from the members? Sorry, so actually, this isn't the the dilapidation. Yeah. Uh, I have I have a specific question about page 165 about the next the actual figures, but um, yeah, that's I'm, I'm on that page too. Uh, uh, I, I I and look, uh, members of the committee, I was and again maybe I had the mistaken impression, but I didn't believe that there was over two million pounds worth of dilapidations in dispute, and three outstanding issues and one going back to 2017, as I read that, I do not believe we were given that impression in the committee, and I am willing to be corrected, but I did not feel that that was what the evidence we were receiving from LPS on this issue. Uh, any comments? Yeah, just on that, uh, to me the figures, you have this claim, and it is this high excess figure, and then there are these agreements, you know, the conclusions, and it seems to be the figures are, are dwindled down. So I'm sure there's a bit of a haggling goes on here. Of course, it seems to be they come down greatly. Uh, they are not necessarily saying it's the department's fault. If somebody makes a claim and there's a contest, that has to be resolved. Uh, but it would be good to know out of out of the five claims, say for 2016-17. What were they settled at, and what was the claim for initially? Um, but also, it doesn't really get that page 165 doesn't really give us the duration of time that each of these takes. Now, again, if there's a contest, that could be longer than, than what you would like. But, but one of the complaints originally was the length of time it was taking the department to go through these. Mm -hmm. Landlords were, were leaving, you know, were. were, were we're coming up short. So, again, more detail on the actual claims, the specific claims. What was the claim for? What was it settled at? And then also, what's the duration of these claims? How long did it take to process and get out the other side into a resolution? Of course, there's still ones that was, is still in dispute. So, you know, the clock's still ticking. But it's, I think we need more detail on this because of the initial complaint in the first place. Um, members, on behalf of the committee. Um I had the distinct impression, often having received the evidence here in front of us, that this was a small issue. There were some issues that were outstanding that had been, were now being dealt with, and particularly the significant issue that we had the correspondence from the company in front of us had been. And I think the indication was made by LPS, and I'm willing to be corrected, uh, was that this was a, a sort of one or two examples. But from the evidence that I've seen from here, and the amount of money that's still in dispute, that is that to me doesn't smack of something that is a small amount. So I would probably uh, like to write back to LPS and get a bit more clarity. And on the also thing is, um, I was under the belief that there was a degree of independent arbitration on some of these issues. So, and I take your point, uh, uh, Vice Chair, about the fact that some of these seem to be reduced downwards. But there's, there is a, there's an indication here that the process is uh, not as straightforward as it could have been. And I think perhaps maybe writing again some clarity, if the committee were in uh, agreement, would we be agreement? Yeah, I, I think what we want would be information on the outstanding ones. Yes. Probably, wouldn't yes. It? Yeah. Are we content? Content. Thank you. 
Uh, if we move on to uh, item three of the correspondence, it was response to the committee from the department detailing the age profile of NIS staff at page 167. Uh, I think we should be looking at this, and again, that's probably something we'd look at uh, in the future work programme when we look at the voluntary exit scheme. Uh, are we content to look at that as part of the age profile issue? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, response to the committee from the department regarding accounting officer training, uh, page 171, uh, asked members to note. Can I ask when did the training take place? Because there was two outstanding, I think, at that time. Mm -hmm. So we're now told in the period since that everything's up to date. So it would be good to know when, when the, the training did finish or complete. Uh, is the committee content for us to go back to the department and ask them when the uh, training was completed? Do we, do we not believe them? Uh, no, I think it's a, it's a question of when it was. I mean, we've been told the training has been content, but it's a question of accounting officer and roles of accounting officer. So it's, you know, it's it, it seems it always seemed a bit strange that you'd be appointing an accounting officer who hasn't done the accounting officer training, but we now see from the correspondence that we seem to have caught up. The question is, when did we catch? When did we catch up? And this becomes germane if there is in a future situation where, uh, for some reason, there's been a, a misappropriation or whatever of public monies, and then the person who's the accounting officer would say, "Well, I actually didn't do the accounting officer's training, so therefore." I couldn't necessarily be accountable and responsible. It's quite a. It, it, I think it's worthy, worthy of clarification. The committee agreed. Agreed. Uh, response from the department to further requests from finance committee on the level of RHI non-domestic tariffs on the regional rates and energy, uh, number two act on page one hundred and seventy-two. So, chair, uh, first of all. Uh, uh, on the page on the letter on 181, it says further request from Finance Committee for level of RHI non domestic tariffs and regional data. So, can I just uh, this really waits at me because it wasn't further request, it was what we had asked for in the first place, and it wasn't forthcoming. That's the first point uh, I make. Uh, on page 182, uh, it, it, it goes on about the uh, clarification. Uh, as to why we didn't get it the first time, uh, they, they talked about ongoing legal. Uh, they, they talked about consulting whether this could be disclosed due to the legal process. Again, is that the reason why it wasn't forthcoming the first time? If it is, why not just tell us? They were checking it out to make sure they could give it to us. I'm happy enough with that, with that explanation. Um, uh, now, out of the information, it seems to be the case that there are, on page 184, uh, Richard Rogers RR advised, this is the top paragraph, the second paragraph of that subheading, Richard Rogers advised that there will be a project board subcommittee meeting early week commencing the 17th of September to discuss two preferred options to be included in the business case. Uh, again, where are the minutes of this project board subcommittee? So out of the minutes that we have received, we can see that there have been more more meetings. Mm -hmm. But we haven't got the minutes. But yet we haven't got the minutes. Uh, and also then, uh, on page 185, uh, it, it says on the minutes that the next date and time of the next meeting will be November. Where are the meetings for the November meeting? Because we've got the minutes for the first meeting and then I think one in February or January. But we, there was one in the middle then, obviously. There was the November one. So where are the minutes for November? Uh, it states clearly uh, that the date of the next meeting, it was agreed to meet again in early November with the request to issue in due course. We don't have the minutes for November. Why not? Uh, it's just detail. Mm. It really is just making sure that we have sight of everything, and I don't believe that we have. And if we are having to pull teeth from the department, then that's, that's why we end up having to go on going back to them. Just be up front and be open and start and give us all the information we require. And if there's minutes that come out that allude to other minutes or meetings, well then it surely it should be a position that they give us everything. Thoughts from the rest of the committee? Good point.
Probably at the next meeting. Yeah. So if they had the meeting in so November, they wouldn't clear the meeting. Yes. Yeah, so presumably the, the minutes of September were cleared in November. So the minutes for November would now be cleared at their next meeting, which may not have taken part yet, taken place yet. So do we ask them for the minutes as soon as they've been cleared? But, but Clark, if you look at page one eight eight. Yes. We've been given draft minutes for the February meeting, I think it is. Drafted, Amor Morelli, 1st of February 2019. Agreed, blank. So they have been giving us draft minutes. I think Paul's point is, where's the draft or actual minutes for November? Yep. Uh, just, just to be so there's draft minutes, but not the minutes from that particular meeting? No, no minutes for the previous meeting. Yeah. So if it maybe it didn't happen. Yeah, so they, they met on February, wasn't it? And then they met in August, I think it was. Uh, sorry, September. So they met the meeting 14th of September and the meeting 1st of February. But if you look at the minutes, if you look at the minutes of the 14th of September, it clearly states the time date of the next meeting is November. Uh, and then we bounce then to the February minutes. So all I'm simply asking is where is the November minutes? Now, it might be the case that didn't need to meet in November. I would doubt it, mind you, because it's such an important issue at that time. So where are the November? There was a meeting in November, which I believe there would have been. Where are the minutes? Did, did the meeting take place? And if so, where's the minutes? Where are the minutes? Where are the minutes? Are we content to write to the department for ask that request? Agreed. Uh, if we move on to the next item of correspondence, a response from the Department of Justice in relation to contractors uh, taking legal challenges at page 191. I'd seek agreement to forward the correspondence to CPD suggesting that they accept the offer from NICTS to engage with them and report any progress to the Committee for Finance. Are we content? Agreed. Yeah. Uh, Details from the Department of the Committee on the 2021 Census legislation tabled at page 98 informs that the order will be considered by the Committee for the Executive Office on the 22nd of April and scheduled for debate in May. I'm asking members uh, to note pending the Committee for TEO consideration of the Standing Road. Are we happy to note? Okay. Uh, moving on to COVID-19 uh, specific issues, letter from Hospitality Ulster in relation to the impact of COVID-19 on the hospitality sector in Northern Ireland's page 194. I'd like to remember members of the 10th of April committee members were asked by email to agree to forward the letter from hospitality to the minister and to agree a response on the issues raised. Uh, the following members agreed, Jim, Jim, Jim and Melissa. Uh, could I seek it sounds like a 60s pop group. It does, actually. Yeah. I'm just trying to work out which one you are. <laughs> uh, could I seek agreement for the purpose of the recording of the minutes to write to the Minister seeking a response to the issues raised by Hospitality Ulster? Agreed. Agreed. A letter from the Northern Ireland Hotels Federation to the Chair at page 198 in relation to the challenges posed by COVID in the hotel and tourism sector. Draw members' attention to the response to the Northern Ireland Hotels Federation at page 202. Uh, are we content? Are members wish to discuss it further? Just so, so we're fighting through the the the, the Northern Ireland Hotels Federation have written to both the committee and the Department of Finance, so they're not. Whereas Hospitality Ulster is effectively asking us to write and also make representations on behalf of their sector or to relay their views. Their the hotels aren't because they're writing directly to the minister as well. Yeah, I, I think it's because Hospitality Ulster probably have a lot more of experience on how to deal with the assembly and deal with the process. Yeah, I wonder. I suppose my one question would be, um, th though I th hospitality also said the issue very clearly, and is it is it worth us having a considering a letter which is so we're not just putting in loads of letters on behalf of individual sort of sectors that we write something a bit more. Um, we can include the, the hospitality also concerns, but so we write something a bit more omnibus, perhaps that reflects on other sectors. Am I making myself? Does that make yeah. sense? Um, through through the through the committee, and one of the things that 
you will all be, as MLAs, you will be receiving lots and lots of correspondence and letters from small companies in various places, and from the hospitality sector and other sectors as well. And both as a, a chair and as a party leader, I am dealing day in, day out with lots of these issues. One of the things I think is the importance of this to Northern Ireland is also the relationship we need to be having with the uh, Department of the Economy and both the Chair of the Econ Economy Committee as well, because many of these things are cross-cutting. Yeah. I would like your permission to write to the Chair of the Economy Committee and ask Quiva if there's any areas where we can be co-locating this information together and doing it on a combined economy finance approach for some of these issues. Uh, I mean, I would completely agree with that, Chair. If I may, I wonder if it's worthy of discussion. Uh, uh, you know, I know um, uh, Keith Archibald has been working with the, the, the economy minister, and as is our colleagues, Neil McLaughlin, who's on that committee, is there a, an argument for some kind of joint finance economy? inquiry or do we want to think about you know we did our program of work session a month or two back and Clark and others put in a huge amount of work and we were creative thinking about it but obviously the world has completely changed do we want to suggest some kind of joint session with the economy committee where we're thinking about you know the joining up of um, uh, the because you know they are completely lockstep in terms of the economic responses that do we that's a suggestion that we may want to come back to and discuss more, but I think it might be you know. So, for example, one of the the main one of the main economic interventions that the executive can make is probably you know, the only one in terms of revenue raising is rates. That's the only one we can mm -hmm. adjust, and obviously, lots of small businesses want help with rates. And I think there's a strong argument, basically, for having a some form of you know, joined upness, yeah. whether that's a joint inquiry or a joint session or what. Uh, um, my perspective on this is having previously been in economy and now being in finance, but also coming from a Chamber of Commerce background and also listening a lot to what's happening in sort of the community out there at the moment. I think it's vitally important that the Assembly is seen to be listening. But I also realise that the likes of Hospitality Ulster, uh, Netta, Manufacturing NI are spending a lot of effort briefing multiple committees. And I think it might be useful if I write to Quiva and say, Quiva, can we arrange for a, some form of joint session so they can provide joint evidence to us so we will be able to work combined so we can apply both, sort of, we can support both the finance ministry and also the economy <coughs> department in trying to get to where we, where we need to go to. I would quite like to write that letter, sort of, uh, post haste. So uh, could I have a, a proposer and a seconder for that? I propose that. I propose. All those in favour say aye. Can I just add on to that, Chair? That briefing took place this morning, as far as I know. Uh, so again, but, but there will be other issues going forward which we will have to work hand in hand together. I, I really do believe that. Just on the point as far as the Northern Ireland Hotels Federation's letter, the two letters aren't the same. The letters commit their, le their, their letters aren't the same. Their letter, their letter to us and the letter to the departments, to the ministers, <coughs> are the same. Now, the same contents in it. But the minister's letter is, is, has two other issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I think we do need to forward that on to the yeah, minister and ask for his response. Yeah, okay. Can we ask the approval to forward that uh, on? All those to say? <coughs> Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, if we move on to the Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance, the shared letter which. which are, just when you're on hospitality. Uh, Northern Ireland. It's just to inform the committee that the past chief executive, Jerry McVeigh, passed away yesterday. Oh no. So yeah. So I just thought. I'd oh please. I, if, I, I'll talk to Colin and the rest of it, but I'll pass on. I'll pass on my personal and also <coughs> the, the committee's condolences for that as well. Are you sure? Oh. Thanks that's, for letting us know. Sad news. Oh. Sorry to hear that. Uh, Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance has shared a letter which is sent to the Minister with a number of key asks to the Government to mitigate the economic impact of COVID on tourism on page 205. <coughs> I think we would be content to pass that on to uh, the Minister, but again, that might be something for a body of work that um, we should be doing in combined with the Economy yes. uh, Committee. I think we could take. But sure, that is a letter to the Minister that was yeah, copied yeah, the yeah, Committee. Yeah. And I think we could take. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine again the sessions where you're taking stuff from probably Tourism Ireland, the Northern Ireland Tourist Board, NITA, and the just even the if 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 the chair and their members are willing, you know, having the joint session yeah. would give it 
a degree of profile and attention. There, there, there is a, a, an obvious issue in relation to joint and social, social distancing. distancing yeah. Yeah. But we can uh, look. We can if uh, Westminster can manage 50 MPs with uh, Zoom, um, we can we can manage something. Yeah. Particularly since it's important. Yeah, and, and to be fair, whilst we will, as members, want to be over everything. I think there will have to be a certain discipline in all of this, so that we need to make sure that we aren't stepping on other people's toes in their job of work. Uh, whilst the uh, about finance and the economy committees do sort of have this economic side of things that we we'll need to keep an eye on, and they will, or eyes will fix on the same subjects time to time, we'll probably have to be guarded that we don't get sucked in, and that they don't get sucked in, and the stuff that's solely our responsibility and their responsibility. So probably we'll need a wee bit of discipline. Knowing Quiva as well I, as well as I do, I think Quiva will keep me in line. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next <coughs> item was the Law Society for Northern Ireland has shared a letter, page 210, which is sent to Minister highlighting its concerns in relation to the absence of services provided by the land registries Northern Ireland and the impacts in both commercial lending and domestic property transactions. Any comments? Yes, yes. Could I come in this? I've had a constituent who's in real trouble because of the situation. Um, I understand that both government departments, whilst their front doors are closed, staff should be continued to work either behind the scenes or online. What seems to have emerged is that some people in the hand registry have just gone home full stop. And I don't see why many of these functions should not just carry on. For instance, a lot of the planners have gone home. A lot of council staff have gone home and rung the dog warden the other day. He answered me from his front kitchen, which is fine. The number was switched through. There was no difficulty whatsoever, and he sorted the problem out. So I'm just wondering what is going on with LPS. Have they literally sent people home to do nothing, or are they trying to maintain a service from either uh, a locked office or from home? Because I'm, I'm hearing from estate agents that um, sales are fa uh, falling through because they can't get the certification from LPS to allow the final stage of the uh, sale to proceed. Do we want to seek uh, further clarification mm -hmm. from LPS what they are doing about remote working? Yep. Can I just say, I don't know if I'll be allowed to mention a name, but it'll be someone very high up. I, I have found that when I ring that number, I can click through, and those queries that I can't solve myself are answered very quickly by LPS, and uh, most of them were to do granted with with the rating and the D, D rating, do you know, where the subsidies was paid to those that were industrial rates that were more complicated than the ordinary 10 and 25. Okay, are we taking on the same thing, Jim? No, I mean, no. I, I find that I can, get my, I can get through very quickly, and this individual is working from home, and I'd be quite happy to share his name. No, there's two issues here. You. There is a gentleman that I'm dealing with as far as the £10,000 grants. He's working from home. Brilliant. No issue at all. Uh, this other issue about the documents that are required for conveyancing a property conveyance mm -hmm. seems to run to the ground. Now, I actually had to contact the permanent secretary, and she got it sorted out very quickly. But the problem was how many people out there don't have access to the permanent secretary. Um, and this, the situation was this gentleman had sold his house in South Down. He was buying land in England. And if he couldn't, couldn't get the conveyancing sorted out with his house, then the, the farm that he was trying to buy in England would have fallen through and he's going to be left high and dry. So, but when he tried to contact LPS, he was told there was nobody working. Not there was nobody working in a front office. There just wasn't anybody working. I think that it's, only, it's fair that I tell you that I have no problem in getting through to him, and I'm quite happy to share that number with you. But there's two different offices. I have no problem at all with the grants, yeah. not at all. It's, right. a, it's, it's a property certifi certification. Well, I can get it out. Is the issue. That, sorry, just, just sure. to get to the point. So is there a specific question we need to be asking, Jim? Just what, what, have, what have they done with their staff that are dealing with conveyancing and, and yes. property sales? It is, it is all about the conveyancing here, and Jim's quite right. So you imagine the impact that this could have on the housing market, where there's a whole chain of house sales that are about to fall through like a domino effect, simply because at some point someone can't get the details to their sister. I think the problem is we haven't yet got all our land registry stuff online. Yes. And therefore you can't from home access. If you have to be in the office to do some of the searches, I think that's probably likely to be the problem. But ju just, uh, just for the sake of, uh, I mean, it's a huge page office. They only need one or two people in it. Mm. They can be more than six feet apart. Yes. Mm -hmm. Surely that's not a. Yeah. 
as many government departments are doing. Yeah. Uh, a skeleton staff in the office and the rest working remotely from home. Uh, 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 committee, if we're happy, let us get clarification on what they're actually okay. doing. If you're content with that, Jim? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And can I get your agreement to send the minister a copy to the committee of uh, the copy to the committee the response to the Law Society for Northern Ireland? Great, thank you. Uh, tabled at page ninety nine, provider and directors of Standall Nursing Homes seeking support for care homes. And may I seek your agreement for the department for information on funding allocator plan to support the care home sector? We agreed. Yes. Thank you, Ronsidi. Uh, other correspondence. The committee for infrastructure has asked if the department for finance had any engagement on the issues raised by the Freight Transport Association Limited at page 213 on the financial pressures on the logistics sector. Members got any comment? For consent, I would like to forward, the, uh, forward to the department to ask if there was any, been any engagement, engagement on these issues raised by Freight Transport Association Limited. We consent. Uh, Clark's briefing paper in relation to the review of legislative consent motions being carried out by the Committee on Procedures at page 218. Ask members to discuss the suggested committee approach outlined in the Clark's paper. I think I'm quite content with that. Are we content? Uh, the Committee for Justice at page 220 informed the committee that a legislative content, consent motion on the private international law implementations of agreements bill, a copy of the legislative consent memorandum is tabled at page 103. We are asking to seek agreement to ask the Department for an initial view on the impact of the provisions on the Bill that relate just specifically to the Department of Finance's remit. Are we content? content. A memo from the Clerks, the Committee Clerks informing of the in-year monitoring revised arrangements for page 228. I will ask members to note as this was issued to the relevant committees following the committee meeting held on the 25th of March. I ask members are they content to note the remaining items of correspondence, outgoing correspondence and routine papers. Are we content? Yeah. We move on to item number 13 on the agenda of the Forward Work Programme. Inform, inform members of the updated Forward Work Programme. It is page 239. And I would like to remind members that both the Business Committee and the Chairperson's Liaisons Group have stressed that, in the current circumstances, committee meetings should be as short as possible. And I apologise, we might just run over the time limit. Resign. Resign. Uh, no chance. <laughs> uh, would be as short as possible and committees should only be carried out carrying out necessary business that relates to COVID nineteen response or any other essential business. It is, however, a matter for this committee to decide what business it considers to be essential for the current circumstances. I to remind members that the raised research papers on the preliminary consideration of e government in Estonia was emailed to members during the recess. And I'd like a, an agreement sometime in the future to schedule an oral briefing on the paper from Reyes at a future date, if we are content. I'd also like to seek, seek agreement to forward Reyes's research paper on the Department's digital shared services, asking for a response to the following issues. A, cor a comparison of Northern Ireland's digital services provision in comparison with uh, Estonia. And for those who are not aware, Estonia is seen as the, uh, as the gold standard across Europe and indeed globally for a lot of these services. An outline of the drivers and barriers to Northern Ireland achieving a similar level of e-government, not to mention BT, obviously. Sorry, I mentioned that. Uh, how barriers could be overcome and what the cost of providing a similar level of e-government would be. Are we content to offer an extended deadline for the response to digital ser shared service, considering the Department's priorities at present? I think we are. Content? And just seek agreement from the members are we content with the forward work programme? Mm. Uh, any other business? Can I ask one quick thing? I apologise. I know it's in here, but I can't find it. When I read these papers, there was a reference somewhere to the department selling assets, property, for £78 million. Pounds. I wanted to know what that was. I can't now find where I read that. Jim, could you find the, the, the actual bit of it and then forward that to the clerk and then we can ask oh. that question? Book papers are up to it, so unless it may be. Mm. So how many million was it? It's somewhere between seven and eight million. They were selling some in the office block or something. They didn't tell us what. 
No. Okay. If we can find that and get the yeah, I, can, I, I did. I must. I didn't see it when I ran it. Oh, I, I I remember seeing it. Mustafa was. It was <coughs> I didn't mark it, unfortunately. So. It's in the um, template response from the department. In the table so papers. It should be in table packs. Uh, <coughs> well, my query was just for us for some amplification in that. As and when you find it. Yeah. As and when I find it. I think it's on the last page of their response, if memory serves. Uh, yeah, page 31 of the pack. The pack, are the table papers? Of the main pack. The main pack. With regards to the capital position, the department is anticipating the sale of a property, which yes. will generate around 78 million additional capital debt budget. Yeah. Just like to know what they're selling. Okay. Uh, team, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your forbearance today. Uh, next meeting, uh, Wednesday, 29th of April, 2.30 here in the Senate chamber. Jim? Yep. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much indeed. Be safe out there, everybody. Thank you. Signed. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.